Please allow me to introduce myself. I am Karen Butler, Assistant Curator at the Kemper Art Museum here at Washington University and also Curator of the George Brock Exhibition on View uh, in the Museum. I am so pleased that all of you have come to hear tonight's distinguished speaker, Professor Uwe Flechner. Tonight, Uwe will present a talk titled In the Greenhouse of Painting, George Brock's Studio Series as Metaphor of Artistic Process. This talk is offered as a way of building on some of the larger questions of the exhibition. Um, I know some of you, I see some familiar faces, have, have come to some of the other talks. Um, Uwe's is the sort of culminating talk. Um, he's the only art historian that we've had. We, we had the conservator from the Phillips Collection and a professor of French literature from uh, Boston University come. So um, let me talk a little, just a little bit about Brock. For Brock, still life was the source of a lifelong investigation into the nature of human perception and the experience of the lived body in the world. It was still life, he said, with its focus on objects within reach of the hand that best allowed him to address the relationship between humans and the objects that make up everyday life. The exhibition explores this relationship and its connection to Brock's artistic process as well as to his long-standing interest in rendering the material quality of objects. We know, for example, that Brock systematically worked through groups of related paintings, revising them for years on end, or putting them aside and returning to them later. This resulted in cycles of works, some ranging across an entire decade, that explore variations on the same motif. If you look closely at many of these cycles of paintings, as I'm sure most of you have, you will begin to see references to the act of painting, paintbrushes, tubes of paint, the artist's palette, even the easel itself appear in many of these paintings. In tonight's talk, I believe, Uwe will explore the appearance of these objects in the works in the exhibition and their development in one of the artist's most important late series of paintings the Atelier or Studio series, painted in the years after 1945. Our exhibition looks at Brock's work from 1928 to 1948, 1945, excuse me, the years leading up to and during World War II. Um, so I believe Uwe is going to touch on some of the works in the show and then Brock's later career, which is a wonderful way to, to kind of uh, build on what the exhibition does. Um, a bit about Uwe. Uh, professor Uwe Fleckner is professor of art history at Hamburg University and director of the Warburg House in Hamburg. He is also founder of the, uh, pardon my German, Forschungsstelle Entartete Kunst, which is a research, a research center on Nazi era degenerate art. From 1997 to 2002, he was vice director of the Deutsches Forum, Forum for Kunstgeschichte, or the Centre Allemand d'Histoire de l'Art in Paris. In 2007, he was visiting scholar at the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art in Paris. In 2008, he was visiting scholar at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. And in 2011, he was the Gerda Henkel Visiting Professor of German Studies at Stanford University. He is the author of numerous books and articles on 18th to 21st century art history, especially on French and German art, art theory and political iconography. Selections of his um, writings include two books on the 19th century French artist Jean-Auguste Jean-Luc Ingres, his dissertation was on Ang, um, as well as two books on the German art historian and cultural theorist, Abby Warburg. Um, he has also edited seven volumes of um, essays and, and books published by the Research Center on Degenerate Art. Um, but I am particularly delighted that Uwe is here this evening because he is author of one of the five essays in our Brock exhibition catalog. His essay in the catalog is titled The Joy of Hallucination on Carl Einstein and the Art of George Brock. 
It explores the development of Brock's career in the 1920s and early 1930s through his relationship with one of the leading early commentators on his work, the German Jewish writer, cultural critic, and art historian, Carl Einstein. And of course, when I was looking for authors to write for the catalog, um, this relationship between Brock and Einstein was something that was particularly unexplored in the literature of Brock. And so, of course, the person to go to was Uwe, um, as the sort of world expert on Einstein. He has published and edited um, numerous essays on Einstein, including the fifth volume of, Carl, of Einstein's collected works, which is Carl Einstein, Die Kunst des uh, no, uh, 20 Jahrhunderts. I can't think what the German 20 is. Um, 20, ah, Kunst, Die Kunst des 20 Jahrhunderts. My, my year of college German has left me. Um, and a, an intellectual biography on Einstein called Karl Einstein und sein Jahrhundert Fragmente einer intellectuellen Biographie, which translates as Karl Einstein and his century fragments of an intellectual biography. And in 2008, he curated the exhibition The Invention of the 20th Century, Karl Einstein and the Avant-Garde, at the Museo Nacional Centro d'Arte Reina Sofia. So let me just end uh, by saying that it's been a great pleasure to work with Uwe and to get to know him. Um, we met once in Berlin uh, a few years ago, and since then most of our correspondence has been by email. So I'm very, very pleased that he was able to come tonight to give this talk and to see the Bach exhibition for himself in person. So please join me in welcoming Professor Uwe Fleck. Thank you, Kate, so much for this nice introduction. Um, it's indeed um, a great pleasure um, for me to speak here tonight, and um, it's a great honor to speak here. Uh, thank you for this invitation to you and to Sabina Ekman. Um, and it's especially uh, such a great honor because the exhibition on Brack is so beautiful and so well done. Um, and um, I cannot recall uh, uh, to have, having seen such a wonderful Brack exhibition, uh, uh, not even in France, where such an exhibition should take place one day. And uh, um, yeah, they are planning a major ex a retrospective uh, for this fall. Um, um, if it can be as beautiful as your show, uh, we will see. Um, so, um, as uh, Kate mentioned, I'm uh, talking on um, a topic uh, which is not in the heart of the show, uh, but I think it's somehow um, and perhaps even closely related to some topics of the show, um, the studio series of uh, the studio series of Josh Brack. <clears throat> the glimpse of the painter's studio throughout the history of the visual arts, a subject very much sui generis. Depictions of the artist at work, depictions of the living and productive working environment of the craftsman intellectual have initiated a meta-genre in which the artist's intention is not confined to the representation of people and objects in space, not confined to portraits, still life, genre painting, or interiors, but goes appreciably further, bringing self-referential viewpoints into the central meaning of the picture. Historically, the special field of art has been the progressive emergence of two subgenres that even today must still be reckoned among the most important of all documents of artistic self-perception. First, in portrayals of a painter, sculptor, or photographer in the studio or other working situation, we are dealing with works in which the demonstration of social status and or aesthetic habitus has steered the artist's choice of subject. Most notably, 
This is always observed when the topic expands to include a self-portrait, as happens, for instance, in works ranging from the famous Las Meninas by Diego Velázquez, painted in 1656 in Prado, Madrid, to Jeff Wald's Picture for Women of 1979, one example in National Museum of Modern Art in Paris. Second, depiction of the studio as an unoccupied room has developed into a picture subject in which the scenographic presentation of the motive as a manifesto of specific artistic convictions and the pictorial reference to the studio owner's current absence together amount to a metronomic portrait of the artist. With the dawn of the modern era around 1800, the studio gained a wholly new significance for the artist and for his work, becoming the preserve of aesthetic autonomy. The growing interest among respectable middle-class society in the subjectivity of the creative personality directed more attention to the creative act at the expense of the rounded, self-sufficient artwork and the real physical setting for artistic processes accordingly came under scrutiny from the public and the art critics. During the early decades of the 19th century, the activity of the painter or sculptor was subjected to a kind of sacralization, and that creative work came to be stylized as an act of worship within the romantic religion of art. This development, with a progressive discarding of traditional ties balanced by a converse tendency for art itself to attract metaphors of, chart, of church and court, the artist accordingly assuming the mantle of painter-priest or painter-prince found a particular focus in the physical circumstances of studios and artists' abodes. The workshop thus became a cultic space, a sacrificial and hallowed setting. Finally, in the context of modernism, from Macca to Mondrian, from Schlitters to Giacometti, the studio setting with which an artist surrounded his day-to-day -day work came to connote the program spatially manifested of his aesthetic convictions. And in the process, the studio itself, at least on occasion, became a work of art in its own right. The evidence for this fundamental change of direction is seen in those works in which the artists have made the reproduction of the real physical layout of their workplaces transparent as a visual metaphor of their own work. And the studio has since become a motive in its own right, a picture worthy subject, not dependent on historical reference or emblematic import. In particular, a great many paintings, drawings, and photographs since the 19th century have by deliberate choice visualized an unoccupied room with neither artist nor model at work. <coughs> the studio, its furnishings, and the things in it that meet the observer's eye may in such works serve to represent the artist and his artistic standpoint. It was in about 1800 that the habitat of the absent artist first became a pictorial subject in its own right. This happens in quite a conspicuous manner in certain works of Caspar David Friedrich, sepia drawings from 1805-1806 of essentially private motivation in which he imposes some meaningful scenography on his austere workplace. Executed significantly on paper, these works attest an artistic interest, wholly self-referential at the outset, as the psychological energies made manifest through the artistically controlled view into the unpopulated spatial frame of an artist's studio as a romantic and symbolic landscape of society. For all their private, indeed intimate character, these works stand at the beginning of a long-sustained long tradition that stretches 
from such works as Eugene Delacroix's Studio Corner of the Stove from 1830 in the Paris Louvre, and Adolf Menzel's Studio Wall, 1872 in the Hamburg Kunsthalle, to Henri Matisse's painting The Red Studio, 1911 in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and Gerhard Richter's Studio, 1985 in the National Gallery in Berlin. And far beyond these, right up to the very latest positions seen at the present moment. The artist, in these and other works, identifies himself and his art with the studio in such a way that its aesthetic space, as seen in the picture, tends to become the programmatic self portrait of the absent artist. The picture, shown the artist's own studio, tends to have an anomalous status among the works of the artist concerned. In spite of the aesthetic significance of the subject, such pictures are out and out occasional pieces, creating at times when an artist wishes to pause and take stock of what he has been doing. Where we can, by contrast, observe systematic engagement with the subject and with its implication for art theory, it is in the oeuvre of George Bright, specifically, specifically in the series of nine pictures that he produced after the Second World War, which are devoted exclusively to Bright's own artistic orientation, using the motive of the studio and the studio still life. His paintings, Studio One to Studio 9, created in the years 1949 and 1956. They were preceded by some one of studio interiors and still lives of the late 1930s, constitute the most important group of pictures in the whole of Brock's later work. During the years of the German occupation, after a short but traumatic period in which painting was only prescribed, Brack had felt it incumbent on him to ensure that contemporary events were discreetly yet clearly reflected in his pictures, in which from now on objects of traditional vanitas featured with striking frequency. The exhibition um, in the Kemper Art Museum and in uh, Washington Phillips collection focuses on the important 1928 to 1945 period in Bragg's still life art and includes some examples from the late 1930s in which the rather randomly chosen world of things in earlier works gave way to a more somber toned selection. Works like Baluster and Skull or Studio with Black Bass, both from 1938, have the deaf head as a dominant or accentuating visual motive, and over and above the formal experimentation aspect, direct our attention to conditions in a Europe simmering with the ominous political conflicts that were to erupt shortly afterwards in the Second World War. During the first two decades of Cubism, the still life had served Brack and indeed Picasso similarly, as a medium for evolution of a new and truly modern concept of space. Now, however, the changed social, economic, and political conditions became the context for a reversion to greater emphasis on traditional picture content. For example, frugal edibles find their way into the pictures of the early 1940s in reference to every everyday life under the occupation. For example, again, as in his still life with fish from 1941, and pitcher, candlestick, and blackfish, 1943, which are also to be seen in St. Louis. Black painted individual fish into the canvases, perhaps even intending to allude to their significance in religious iconography, though the somber black in which he painted them holds out scant promise of Christian consolation. It is certainly striking that many of this artist's still lives 
from the early 1940s show the studio as a closed off, even hermetic space. Paintings such as Mandolin's Core from 1941 and Large Interior with Palette from 1942, these two are exhibited in the Kemperhardt Museum, are characterized by dark, indeed muddy colors. They block the view in the background with generally dark surfaces that have the effect of barriers, and by this means they seal the spaces off completely. These and other still lives present fairly claustrophobic views of Bach's working circumstances, and the still life genre under Nazi occupation becomes a way of depicting a last refuge as the means of expression of a tasted inner emigration and in a manner highly exceptional for Bach. It takes on political connotations. Seen in this light, it is readily understandable that in his new works after the war, he felt impelled to subject the artistic uncertainties of the 30s and 40s to critical challenge, and so eventually to put them behind him. While Brock was in the habit of working on many canvases at once, and his studio series from the late 1940s definitely involved some parallel working, nothing <coughs> in the compositional approach of Studio One suggested at the time that this painting would trigger a whole series of pictures. Conceived less as an interior than as a pure still life, this canvas articulates an extremely understated echelon of three paintings in the space of the picture and the room alive arranged parallel to the image surface and taking up almost no perspective depth, a simple still is shown, positioned in the immediate foreground and almost abuting the lower format boundary. Black's Black Jack and Lemons, 1949, now in Paris in a private collection. Further back, on a chair that is more suggested than shown in the lower right part of the picture, the eye is attracted by the further and larger painting in which the white, sharp-edged silhouette of the second jug, this one on a black ground, dominates both its own composition and the complex visual structure of the superordinate overall composition. Black had derived this shape from a cut-out cardboard template that he continued to keep in the studio in the years that followed. At the top margin of the picture, the painter has additionally ensured that the slender strip of background at least hints at the spatial position of the large still life. And on the extreme left, extending far beyond the picture margin, one discerns the third picture or more preci precisely, its elaborately ornamented frame. The constellation of shapes assembled here maintains the utmost geometrical rigor. Severe verticals and no less severe horizontals organize the picture structure from painting's edges and the few indications of plaster work or paint work on the wall in the background. Together, they form a strict system of coordinates into which the outlines of the painted objects, the two jacks in particular, are inserted, bringing enlivening, indeed vitalist notes into this nature mort. <coughs> Outside the inner painting's world of things depicted as painted things, only the calligraphic framed relief design on the left and a small piece of cloth evidently tucked in behind the front still life seen in the lower right corner of the picture and thus immediately adjacent to the signature breakout of the rectangular severity. The paint application emphasizes the work's two-dimensional overall character by the grayish pink of the background generated in part by waveform furring with the paint comb a reminiscence of Cubist work of the artist's early period, 
together with a white hollow shape and its back, black background, both painted without perceptible brush marks, contributes further to the painter's purely planimetric presentation. Its specific combination of motives makes this frugal still life with its very few depicted objects into a studio picture that does not simply depict the present artworks as the typical object world of a painter's workplace, but directs the attention by its selection of these pictures to the artistic production process in particular. The inner paintings are presented to the observer's eye in three distinct stages of development. First, the large still life, evidently a mere sketch as yet, its white object surrogate still awaiting the painter's hand. Next, the almost completed, but not yet signed or framed colored still life. And finally, the painting on the left, which is ready for presentation, but is not actually visible only a section of its frame telling the observer of its presence. If for a moment the imagined studio one resting on its easel in Brach's workshop, then the painting will conjure up for us a mise en beam of pictures inside pictures, waiting, granted a flight of fancy, only to be captured in turn by a further painting, and so on and so on. But and yet, this is by no means to exhaust the wealth of illusion through which the picture of pictures points to the process nature of the artist's activity. Through the depicted objects in it, and above all through the quotation-like rigidity of their composition, it challenges the observer to undertake a comparison with one of the most celebrated artist manifestos Painting. Nicolas Poussin, painting a self-portrait for Paul Fréard de Chanteloup in 1650, had built up as a strictly right-angled tectonic formation of paintings receding in ashes. The whole, in effect, incorporating his own counterfeit in a witty art theoretical reflection. By means of an eye-studded diadem attribute, the personification of a hospitably received pictura, whose picture fragment is seen close to the painter, introduces a topic of prospective seeing and invokes an intimate relationship of both the artist and his collector to the activity of painting. Georges Braque, who selected the virtually identical canvas form of his painting, seems to have been fully aware of entering into the paragone, the artistic rivalry with the old master, as his hidden self-portrait too embodies a learned illusion that places modern artists on an equal ranking alongside the pictor doctors of French classicism and his art theoretical allegory. In Braque's studio still life, the portrait of the artist has been replaced by the white jug, doubtless an allusion to Cicero's concept of the human body as a vessel empty until the soul is poured in. The painter has still to apply his art to completing, to completing the empty outline of this still merely sketch in jug, whereas in the finished picture of the unfinished picture, it is left to the viewer to fill the hollow shell with content, meaning, and life, the nature more, thereby becoming nature vivant, a living nature. In the eyes of the historically illiterate amateur of art, the jack itself, picture in picture, typical still life subject and studio requisite, metamorphosis into a cipher for the artist himself and his gradual realization of his own essential nature through his work on his creations. A meaningful metaphor of painterly activity, never more so than in times of artistic searching for the self. <clears throat> 
while still working on, his, on this first painting, George Braque had made a start on some further canvases depicting his studio in Paris and Varangeville. And by 1956, these works had gradually developed into a more or less complete series. Given that the works, uh, given that he would generally be working on two or more pieces at once, in two stages running from 1949 to 1952 and 1952 to 1956, respectively, it is scarcely feasible, let alone worthwhile, to determine a definitive sequence for the pictures. Most of them thus being synchronous, progressing in parallel rather than successively. There is no question of a linear or even evolutionary purposive sequence in their genesis, which with Brock advancing from one pictorial solution to the next. What can be observed is the symphonic character of the series as a whole, with variations on the theme of the atelier, their climax perhaps in Studio 8, collectively constituting an overall vision that can now, of course, only be reconstructed within the transient medium of exhibitions. So paint is perhaps a new topic. However, for as long as these pictures remained in the painter's actual workplaces, their special collective character meant that real space was set over against the sequence of nested visual encapsulations of space with motivic and spatial links operating in multiple directions between them, even though each individual painting was, of course, invested with its own compositional autonomy. Although Studio One functioned as a kind of overture to the cycle as a whole, with certain fundamental thematic and motivic strands already emerging, their spatial development, in particular, was reserved for the paintings still to come. The very next one, Studio Two, in fact, with its notably reticent palette of dark brown, dark gray, and dark olive tones, deploys an exceedingly complex spatial concept that presents formidable hermeneutic problems for the observer. Initially, the eye registers, registers things and fragments of things from the conventional object world of an artist workshop. The plinth-born sculpture of a female head, representing Bruck's sculptural efforts during his period of painter's block in 1939, 1934, uh, 1939, 1940, a palette, easel frames, various containers, and other characteristic items from the repertory of still life paintings. And also a whitish gray bird, rapidly perceived with the help of the rectangular frame confining it, to be a picture within the picture. This painting, too, then, takes up the theme that runs with light motive effect through the whole series, namely the artistic mise-en-scene of pre-existing artworks. Here, however, and in contrast to Studio One, not a few of the objects shown defy the observer to discern whether it is the things themselves and not rather their previously created visual simulacra that provide the motives for this studio interior. Even the bird has its head projecting beyond its framing rectangle. In front of it is a bowl, or still life of a bowl, with grapes barely out. The further fruit bowl is on the right of the picture, on or in front of the picture of an object that could be a jug in mild cubist alienation. Quite a few of the motivic elements allow this kind of multiple interpretation, evidently by the artist's intention, and multiple ambiguity likewise characterizes the spatial structure within which these objects confront. The bipartite vertical configuration of the painting is fairly readily grasped through, not with everyday spatial perception. It combines a powerful, almost exclusively from above perspective in the lower half of the picture with a far less decisive frontal view in the upper half. 
The resulting clash of perspectives generates a spatial discontinuity right along the horizontal central axis that draws the observer deep into the picture. However, the composition of architecture spread over the form and width breaks the spatial foldings of the picture's height, and the horizontal development of the painting is no longer susceptible to rational perspective and lenses. Straight lines, largely free of objects, run across the page, some of them more or less diagonally, imposing a grid on the first glance spatial impression. One effect is that, as is seen also in the Studio 4 painting, they trace out a highly compressed cage structure that may well have been depicted on a bird picture later destroyed that is documented for this period in Bruck's studio. But at the same time, they spread in their own free rhythm across the picture as a whole, thus subjecting it to a multiple articulations that might be described through though essentially only by association, as a concertina-like folding of space. In the introductory visual motives on the left of the picture, Brack has explicitly alerted the observer of this multi-perspective principle underlying his composition by endowing his sculpted female head with no fewer than three alternative profiles. Moreover, the easel immediately behind this head admits two or three conflicting perspectives, uh, perspective views while many of the remaining objects and fragments of objects cannot be assigned even ambivalently to specific locations in space, so strongly do the depicted motives resist any readily grasped approach to placing them. And there is no clear demarcation between fore, middle, and background. In spite of all this, Studio 2 does not appear disorganized, not Withstanding the entropic abundance of objects, the picture defining motives, sculpture, palette, container, and bird, are framed in three vertically separated planimetric, planimetric zones. The profile of the female head and a free arrow form in the center of the overall frame contribute directional and motion indicators that tend to provide compositional counterbalance for the vigorous right-to-left flight of the bird. The artistic outcome of this painting is a swelling and contracting space, crisscrossed by discontinuities. The pulsating perspective experience draws the observer almost physically into the picture. Brack took such a concept of space to its artistic ultimate in his Studio 5. Here, the artist dispenses with linear marking of perspective discontinuities and with strict planimetric articulation in any form, so that the work generates a visual space so fluid in character as to offer no orientation at all for the observer's self-immersion into the painting. The large bird silhouette has now disengaged completely from its canvas it appears both as a mirroring or reflecting surface of elements lacking any spatial location, and as a transparent optical body acting as a prism within which further forms are refracted. However, the absence of perspective precludes assignment of any particular spatial zone to either the flying bird outline or the palette at the lower margin both of which have arrived in the picture effectively in isolation from spatial coordinates of any kind. Other objects in the picture, if the viewer succeeds in pinning them down in the first place, penetrate each other and form hybrid three and two dimensional combinations that make no secret of their ancestry in a developed variety of cubist formal language. The composition structure is broken up by this means into undefined spatial layers and splinters with barely any links to the three-dimensional world of Euclidean spaces. 
time and again, the paintings of the studio series proffer this or that individual object fragment to their viewer for identification, but time and again, equally, the receptive impulse to name objects is frustrated in the same way as that for spatial orientation. However, the polyvalence of Bruck's studio depictions does not simply throw doubt on the status of things and on the degree to which they are real, does not simply generate a disorienting in indeterminacy in spatial relationships. For it seems that the motivic world of the paintings and their hypothetical iconographic function are themselves the subject of artistic questioning. Easels assume anthropomorphic forms, vessels present themselves by virtue of their exhibited or withheld corporality as a substitute for human figures, and the outlines of bird and palette are planted in the picture as casually exchangeable formal rhymes. The efforts of art historians faced with such a fundamental critique of the object world to discover content loading in some guise have therefore inevitably been in vain. The bird, in particular, has from time to time had emblematic import attributed to it, in spite of the warnings by the artist who always repudiated the notion of symbolic content in his object. I quote, in my painting, there have never been any symbols. Brack himself, here in total accord with the testimony of his paintings, associated the flying bird's motif solely with the function of generating space and movement. In Brack's studio series, his real-life workshops have been transmuted to a picture space possibly uh, possible only in a pictorial creation. In the depicted space, the laws of volume and perspective are suspended, along with integral object boundaries and all concepts of space sanctioned by the laws of physics, as well as any form whatsoever of traditional iconographic investment of images with meaning. The greatest artistic freedom in composition and color is reached in the painting Studio 8 which, for the time being, until the seventh picture was overpainted as Studio 9, marked the conclusion of the whole series as uh, the whole series of works. All the artistic idiosyncrasies of the preceding studio pictures are brought together here. The things depicted or pictures within the picture, as the case may be, plunge into a spatial free flow, picking up on the already initiated interplay of wholeness and fragmentation, abstraction and concretion, opacity and transparency. Spatial viewer expectations are disappointed once more. The general pattern is for the appropriate orientation to be invited and then immediately revised. Also, Brack has deployed strong local colors, much as happened on the transition from analytical to synthetic cubism, as an artistic device to help him characterize the spatial fluctuation of the picture space. Bright red, orange, and yellow tones now designate a door of cupboard or room, a tabletop or tablecloth, and also the canvas of the bird, which appears here too. In this way, the prominent luminous areas form space-filled planes, although these do not link up into a consistent perspective system valid beyond the compass of the individual picture. In this painting, the artist seems to have thought to achieve a summation of his painterly insights and a dotted brushwork of a number of still life depicted in the lower right-hand corner actually points straight back to the work's antecedent to Bruck's synthetic cubist work phase of the years around 1914 and after. Over the course of his picture series, Bruck subjected all physical givens of his studio and the objects present or imagined in it to constant metamorphosis. Uh, to constant metamorphosis. 
things turn into pictures, pictures into things, things and speeches are dissolved, crystallized again, temporarily at least, into new entities. The processes of such metamorphosis, evidently prompted by the concurrent jobs in progress in the two workshops, are recorded in the individual painting partly by hybrid picture elements marking transitions, and partly also by the diachronic aspect conferred on them by the succession of pictures in the series as a whole. Particularly if the observer is able to trace the evolution of individual thematically significant motives and spatial configurations from work to work. It was the important German theoretician Karl Einstein who drew attention to the significant role of form and transformation of this kind in Bach's artistic production process. In 1934, in a monograph on the artist that was in truth more its author's own Summa Aesthetica, Einstein presented an illuminating insight into the suspension of the subject-object dichotomy dichotomy in and through the work of art, which in contemporary painting could no longer be considered a fixed entity complete in itself, but must now, Einstein contended, be seen rather as an accumulation of, I quote, mental functions, and as I quote again, dialectical organisms. While working on the Prag monograph, Einstein had investigated his artist's friend's visual treatment of space and found that Bach's painting, in common with the contemporary art mainstream, had definitely shattered all subject-object relationships. I quote, the integral and unchanging ego is for us as much a thing of the past as a belief in qualitatively integral or continuous space or continuous time, end of quote. By the same logic, he opposes the experiencing of space to that conceptual space and describes the vitalizing value to the two-dimensional realization of spatial experiences. Although Einstein had derived this up-to-the-minute analysis of contemporary artists' ideas on space from his deep familiarity with the Cubist and post-Cubist works of Black and also of Picasso, it still serves as an impressively lucid characterization of the formal content of the later series of works. Black's paintings of the 1920s and early 1930s which had not entirely escaped the influence of surrealist art, are cited by Einstein as evidence of a wholly transformed approach to reality. I quote, the late pictures of Black are uncommon significance for us because in them, in contrast to 19th century pictures, a different and more complex real is envisioned and created. In the presence of these works, the criteria of interpretation or successful representation are no longer useful. A profound revelation or extension of the object has taken place. Seeing is no longer positivist in character, but flows from hallucination. In his 1934 monograph, as also in the third edition of his Art of the 20th Century, Einstein expounds an understanding of his longtime associate's artistic attainments that proves extremely illuminating in relation to the studio picture scenes. Einstein speaks here of a revaluation of seeing, gradually affected over the course of works of the unambiguous nature of causality goes on, is suspended in the artist's works, his hallucinatory vision fracturing the stable world of objects and the continuity of spatial and temporal links between them, expressing itself in leaps and analogies. From this analysis, Einstein, resident in Paris from 1928 and in close contact with the artist even before then, infers far-reaching anthropological implications. On the basis of the works of Black, 
as those of Picasso and the Surrealists too, he elaborates a proto-existentialist concept of freedom under which the identification of the artistic ego with objective form and the fusion of the two accomplished in the work of art led to the complete self-surrender of the individual identity. The protest against rational reality is therefore made manifest in the hallucinatory reality of images culminating ultimately, Einstein argues, in the painter's insistence through his work on, I quote, adaption of reality to the vision. Like many fellow artists of his time, Brack was extremely interested in aesthetic and philosophical questions, but he never evolved a systematic theory of art. His pronouncement on art, few in number, variously published and in some cases relayed secondhand, are distinctly influenced by the discussions he and Einstein must have conducted <coughs> on visual art topics. An influence reflected in particular in his rejection of logic and causality and his emphasis on intuition, metamorphosis, magical transformation, and overt dynamism. In 1935, for example, Brack responded in Kagidar to a survey of the current situation in the arts conducted by Christian Zerbo. I quote, we have to destabilize all reason-based truths and liberate mankind from its logical ways of reacting to magic. People are so steeped in logic, in fact, that it will probably be a case of letting them get still more deeply mirrored in it until the point is reached where the law of contradiction cuts in and forces them to recognize that reality inheres not in imitation but in magic. For the greater the addiction to imitation becomes, the smaller the degree of reality and the smaller the scope for instinctual energy to manifest itself. And quote of George Brack. Brack had a house designed and built for him between 1927 and 1930 by the architect Auguste Perret in the Rue du Bouanguet, now Rue Georges Brac, in the French capital's 14th arrondissement. The entire top floor consisted of a studio that significantly had a large glass area facing south. He further commissioned a US-born architect, Paul Nelson, who had studied under Perret, to build him a house and adjacent studio in the Normandy resort of Wachenschmidt sur Mer between 1930 and 1931. A good-sized studio was added to the house itself in 1949. He was to work in both places, alternating between Paris and Varangeville until his death in 1963, not infrequently taking the pig paintings on which he was currently working with him when he moved from one studio to the other. Some details of the interiors point to original locations for specific motives from a studio series, but as we have already seen, a Veduta style purely representational depiction of his workplaces was no part of Brock's concern as he planned and executed the, his paintings. The artist had developed his own personal way of looking at his studio spaces. It could hardly have been otherwise perspective, not confined to a mere view into the room, but of course embracing all the personal domestic aspects that linked him as occupier and user to his immediate physical surroundings. Even before his cubist period ended, Brack had adopted a perception of space that was to prove of decisive importance later when he came to depict his, studio, uh, his own studio. I quote, at the time, so at the cubist time, I had begun to concentrate on painting still lives because in nature there is space that I would call tactile, even physically graspable. This satisfied my constant desire to actually touch the thing, not just contemplate it. It was this kind of space that always fascinated me because it was the essence of early cubist painting, the exploration of space. End of 
In the late 1940s, he compared the notion of tactile space to the feeling for space that an artillery man must have, the shell being an extension of his arm seeking to reach the target physically as distinct from visual space, which is space as experienced by a tourist, looking at the local sites in a detached and distanced way. The comparison strikes one as distinctly bizarre, given that its valuation of the military assault on target is not entirely is not only positive, but actually identified with the activity of the artist in Bruck's understanding of the term. And in the paintings of the studio series created in these years, the observer finds precisely this physically graspable conception of space creating the artistic meaning same for the physical appropriation of the living and working spaces by the very individual who lives and works in these spaces as changing perspectives on the interiors and the objects contained in them, uses the various requisites found to hand and continually modifies the way they are arranged. In these pictures, Spatial relationships are no longer evolved from a single, perhaps central viewing point. Rather, on what is ultimately a cubist principle, changing aspects are confronted in a fragmented way with each other, and the artist's, artist's body moving about in the studio is evoked in the continual swelling and shrinking of spatial nearness and remoteness. In this way, both in theory and in Brack painterly's practice, space and perspective lose any trace of mathematical and geometrical fixity. Instead, as the artist's work on the paintings proceeds, they become experiential, uh, experiential categories of pragmatic context, contact with the experienced environment. I come to a conclusion. The spatial experiences that Brack turned into art had already explored intellectually by Karl Einstein, whose close approach to the artist's friend's paintings, stimulated as it was by philosophy of life, ideas from Nietzsche to Bergson, is notably vitalist in its semantic implications. Among others, as already shown, he contrasts the dead conceptual space of academic art with the experiences of space expressed in Bruck's works, to which Einstein expressly attributes a vital value. In correspondingly loaded language, Einstein goes on the attack in his writings as does Bruck in his pictures against rational art theoretical doctrines and propagates a view of art's élan vital according to which artistic form forces its way upwards through accumulated layers of historical and psychological deposition till it reaches the surfaces of the art. Although the painter of the studio series post-date Einstein's theoretical reflections, their specific understanding of motive, composition, and the handling of space makes them undoubtedly an artistic counterpart to such a theoretical edifice based as it was on detailed familiarity with both cubist and surrealist works. Last depictions of the studios are characterized by an oscillation between subjective vision and objective other. By proceeding intuitively, the painter triggers metamorphotic processes and a kind of autonomous or self-perpetuating genesis of artistic form sets in, a process that can no longer be described as a freely chosen strategy of the artist, but only as an emanation of unbuilt forces, a growing and budding of the picture elements in whose service the painter functions as the medium for unconscious processes. The fact that aesthetic phenomena of this kind are a feature of the studio series in particular has its own inwardness for the portraiture of his immediate working environment also served Brack as a stage in which to set out his self-assessment as an artist. During the time he was working on the series, he told the French poet Francis Ponge 
echoing the life philosophy of his own friend Einstein, that while at working, he felt like a gardener. I quote Parrish, quoting Park. These pictures, here he stretched out his arm and pointed, grow of their own accord. I just need to keep a watchful eye on them, and of course help out a little sometimes by cutting back a branch here, giving a shoot space to develop there, and generally training things into shape. Francis Ponch also noted in relation to this avowal that Rack did in fact keep a number of pot plants in his studio and, as a doubtless staged photograph from the late 1940s testifies, even wished his workplace to be seen as a greenhouse nurturing horticultural and artistic organisms alike. In this way, both in Ponch's poetic evocation and in Braque's studio pictures, the workplace itself become a vitalistic metaphor for painting. I quote Ponch again. A studio, after all, has all the characteristics of a hothouse, but I see this also as evidence of Braque's magical powers. Under his gaze, in his presence, in the presence of his spirit and through his actions, the prevailing climate in, this, in the place seems to be highly conductive, um, con conducive to the growth of plants and equally of pictures. Thank you very much for your Studio in 
so in, 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 in everyday life, he's really withdrawn into the studio and he's going back in the studio in, in the process of his workings to depict in the studio um, representations of the studio um, and, and in order to learn about himself, what, what now can be done after all these experiences. Um, and then, of course, he wanted to be sure of sure uh, of what he is doing of his own handicraft um, and, and if you can prove or if you can convince yourself uh, that your body is doing it anti-rational, doing it all by yourself, you can convince that you are doing the right thing, that you are making it in, on a sure um, that you have, you have found a strategy which you can be sure of and not hesitate. you don't have to hesitate, you don't have to have doubts on your own work uh, your own, uh, about your own work so, um, highly rational works with an anti-rational metaphor to explain um, yeah, to explain to yourself what you are doing. And this is, of course, this is a problem. This is a tension, and you, we cannot solve it. And it's 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 a period um, of so much tension, and we have to stand that um, some uh, of these problems still are problems. It still cannot be uh, yeah, it cannot be combined in harmony. Thank you for this question. Very, very. In regards to the grand tradition, then where would you context, where would you contextualize Baroque being sort of absent of any sort of formal training, like this raw, core, mm -hmm. unadulterated sort of hand over the mind? So and that what came to my mind was the grand tradition of say like Cezanne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody who's formally trained but can dissolve all of that. Where does Baroque rest in that? The answer is in the exhibition, <laughs> really. Uh, you can see it's in the exhibition that he is, which is a strange thing, and perhaps it's uh, responsible for this, uh, for the lack of perception today, or let's say for in, in the last decades, um, that he is, he is an old master somehow, um, which is a strange thing in those days. Um, Picasso is not, Picasso is changing everything. Um, he's, he's making experiments, and for us today, it's much easier to understand Picasso more because he seems to be more modern, because he's more open, more you know, he takes more risks every day, and so forth. Um, but um, the, the interesting thing is that um, that Braque developed this modernity, and up, and after a certain point, after the, the experiments of the the analytic and synthetic cubism, he started, okay, now I have learned so much and I, now I want to achieve. I want to make, yeah, let's say classical modern painting, which is a contradiction in itself. And, and in, the, in the show you can see how, um, how masterly this is done. And it's not old-fashioned. There's a modern, experimental, old master that you can see. And this is one of these contradictions in this Braque. And, and, and our friend Einstein loves his friend um, Braque, especially because of this quality. Um, and and he, he was close to Picasso, Gris, uh, Leger, to all the, the leading cubists. Um, and, but he thought Braque is perhaps the best painter because he at a certain point he decided I stop with making experiments and now I'm doing art. Um, and this is interesting to read this against quotations uh, about, about Picasso, um, where Valencia of course sees every quality, but he says, so he's, he's, he's taking every day a new approach, making in the next step a new experiment, but never achieves really something. Um, so, so this is two concepts. And of course, this Picasso concept, to us, is much more a concept, a concept of our times. And, and so our focus is always on Picasso. Um, as you can see, how many Picasso shows have you seen or could have seen, and how many black shows? Not very many. Um, so it's for decades the first uh, major black show that you have here. Um, and of course, there's the Paris one coming up, and I promise after the, uh, the next 20 years, we have none. Unless some courageous curator says, okay, I, you know, I have to, to put a new focus on that. I was thinking, as you were talking about the series, I was 
thinking about Picasso's Women of Algiers, mm -hmm. which is, the, the Kemper has one of them. Mm -hmm. And just to think about the difference between the two of them, that Women of Algiers series is made at about the same time. It's 1955, it's about the mm -hmm. same time as, mm -hmm. as Brock's making his atelier. And that is really a, a series, it's A through LMN, O, o it's about mm -hmm. 15 or 16 paintings. And it really is kind of progression yeah. as a series towards the end, whereas this Atelier series, I mean, it, it sort of illustrates, mm -hmm. it's really, there's no progress, you know, in yeah. some ways. It's, yeah. it's as you were saying. It's, yeah. I mean, to the but extent that he takes number seven and paints over, making it nine, I mean, mm -hmm. there's. Yeah. And, and even, you, and if you make a show uh, of this uh, eight paintings, you would not hang them from one to eight. There's no need. You can do whatever you want, because there is no progress. There is no aim he's targeting on. Um, and this is a good following up question, because um, what, what Picasso proves with, and, and the, the Women of Algiers is one example, there are several others, um, he made, he's making experiments. And what do you do as a, as a good natural scientist when you make a peril, uh, uh, an experiment? You have to change one parameter at a time in order to know exactly what comes out of your experiment. And this is exactly exactly what, what Picasso does. So he takes the, 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 the Dela Croix painting and makes his version. And then he had got an idea how to change it, and he changes one aspect of the image and paints this through. And then the second, the third, and, and so on. And this is the number of series. Um, and um, and um, Black is, is working in a much more, um, um, yeah, it's not open, you cannot say open because because it's open as well, but he's working not as systematic as, as Picasso is. Um, Black is working on two, three, four canvases at a time, uh, going back and forth, changing from day to day, and then he decided, okay, we'll go to, you know, I make three weeks at Normandy in my, in my second studio, he rolls it up, binds it on the top of the car, drives to, to Normandy, and then paints on. Uh, perhaps starts off seeing something new at the same time, uh, going back and forth. There's no, no, there's no experimental target um, that he uh, wants to hit. With this series. Uh, I just have one question. I think I asked Becky the question also a couple times. Is there, um, are there any new uh, did Brock ever really engage with phenomenology? Um, not over no, not, as, not to my knowledge. Um, those things develop in, in a very parallel um, way. And um, um, I have no proof uh, or nothing, no documents that really tells us that he is working, reading, knowing about those uh, people. But um, on the other hand, um, even if we knew that, it would not change my approach to the picture because um, no good artist, and, and Brack, of course, not uh, would read Melody. Say, okay, I have to my brush took now. I have to go like this because Melody uh, tells me this and that. Um, so they, I think that this is you're completely right. There is something in common. That very, it's very clear. Um, but this is parallel. This is you know they they learn from from their time and from from uh, what the time wants from a writer, a thinker, an artist. They, 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 they learn similar things, and one is a philosopher and expresses it in his text, one is a painter and tries to make similar things in his paintings. And of course we, can, we cannot explain uh, Brack through Merleau-Ponty and not Merleau-Ponty through Brack, but we can explain in what time they lived when we look at those um, um, at those uh, personalities um, in, in the same, uh, in the same, in other same aspects. I was more thinking of his approach towards uh, tactility or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would see that in direct parallel to yeah, yeah, know, yeah, sure, sure. Um, So not only as parallel, but so, I mean, I think you could. Strikes me, uh, 
thinking back over human history that, that most of it, most of human history was making two-dimensional images on two-dimensional surfaces. And that the invention of perspective is actually rather contemporary, starting whenever you want to really date it from late Middle Ages or early Renaissance or whatever. And, and in those times, it was always involved some kind of storage telling or telling or um, uh, you know, there was a meaning. So the, the hunters in the hunt, the, the important, you know, the religious figures and the temporal leaders and so on. W was there was there any sense of going back to those kind of going back to those periods of square one, you know, and experiencing what they had? And is the fragmentation of these images? You know, intellectually, did that have anything to do with sort of saying, I'm telling many stories at once, there's not just one story here? Yeah. Um, I think the, already the fact that he um, does not um, work on such topics and in such general, this is already telling. Um, of course, um, he could have made history paintings. Um, history paintings exist in the 20th century. Um, but yeah, you will not find them in the in the work of Brecht or Picasso or any Cubist uh, painter. And, and uh, already this fact is very telling. And um, so, but we, perhaps we have to um, to stick a moment of um, at the idea of meaning. Um, so, what is the meaning of a history painting? Is it inside or is it outside the artwork? Is it only transporting something which might be a very modernist um, answer? But perhaps um, the meaning um, that we see in a religious painting is not in the painting, but the, the, the painting is transporting an outside of the artwork meaning. Um, so you could say um, these, for example, this series of paintings is without meaning. Or you could say this is the first time but this series, but this kind of art is the first time when meaning really becomes the meaning of the artwork itself and not um, a, a transport medium of outside. Well, yes, I, I think certainly the, the, the subject matter of modern artwork is very different from mm -hmm. classical or more primitive yeah. artwork yeah. And, and, and has to do with the, the, the landscapes and the still lifes and the you know, the, the domestic set, all of those things yeah. have something to do with elevating not just the important people in society, you know, sort of yeah, speaking sure. toward it, but um, the, 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 to me, the, I, as, I, as I look at those, the, uh, the aspect is that there's several realities here, there's several stories contained <laughs> in my life, and that the pattern making alone is sufficient, that it's really, you know, the juxtaposition of textures and flags and certain colors and, and the movements you were expressing from left to right, right to left, in, in and of themselves, don't require a story. That they're, that they're completely, yeah. you know, engaging mm -hmm. and wonderful all by themselves. Yeah. They say, say, they don't transport a story, but they have, of course, a, a certain narrative aspect. And yeah. This is the aspect that, as you uh, yourself put it, the, the, narrative, the, the narrative of, um, of fragmentation. Yeah. Um, so if, if you have, would have um, um, a central perspective in those paintings, you would keep one, you, let's say you would keep the hero, the, the one person looking, the yeah. one existence yeah. in the painting, or at least looking at the painting. And even this is shattered uh, by the fragments, by the multi-perspective approach. So you have perhaps more, many spectators, or you have one which is not standing still, but meandering around in the room as you usually do um, in your room. Nobody um, is you know, sitting and looking with one eye closed, which is a convention of the, of the central perspective to the room. So you, you go in back and forth, you're standing up and sitting down, coming back the next day, um, so you have a shattered um, perspective, and you have an experience, an, a living room. Um, and I think this is especially the case um, when you depict the studio, because this is a place where the actual painting is painted. And so you are very aware of what's 
going on in such a world? Well, and for me, the net result is if you think of a conventional photographic still life, it's something that's only really going to engage you perhaps once or twice, whereas you really want to come back and look at this mm -hmm. frequently. And whatever the rationale is, it produced something you know, that, that is much more engaging than, than simply rendering it in, in perspective. Mm -hmm. If you flip through any introductory textbook on modern art uh, in the States, you will grasp a overarching narrative of um, artists working before the First World War and uh, trying to make art that they think will uh, generate a better society. And then you see a crisis during the First World War and you see the artists of the new objectivity um, and, and the return to order in France uh, moving away from, uh, seemingly moving away from some of these innovations uh, that took place uh, just before the First World War. And Brock, seems exceptional and that he held on to the saturated foam as color and he held on to the cubist aesthetic and he kept at it through the 1950s. So what helped him to keep his faith in what he and his colleagues were doing before the First World War? This was an excellent question. Um, and, um, I'm not sure. Um, is, there, is there motivation? Uh, let's put it that way. It was not a very clever decision. Um, if you see um, the fate of perception, um, um, he, yeah, he, he, he could have behaved more textbook like, it would be more clever, actually. Um, and of course, those textbooks are right, uh, but they are textbooks. So they, mean they, 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 they define a kind of average standard how. Of art history is developing in time, but if you look close to at least most of the phenomena, um, everything is much more interesting than textbook. Um, and when my, my students, uh, first uh, year students, come and, do, and want to know what textbook they should learn, uh, read um, in order to study art history, um, I always refuse to give them a bibliographic um, um, reference on textbook. I said, take the most specific um, essay on art history that you can find and try to, to concentrate on one topic and try to make some, some specific part clear to you and then move on to the second. And perhaps in some days, I, I have not reached the state, but some days perhaps your, your mosaic is so close that you can see an overall image. I'm, I'm not yet to reach this. Doesn't it seem that he was very obsessed with space and time? And so even though even though his, his earlier work was maybe taking a bunch of different sort of traditional perspectives and kind of combining them together, after the war he managed to find other means to combine to represent time and space besides just this combination of perspectives. Yeah. Um, you're completely right, um, but I did not want to give this answer, which would have been uh, perhaps uh, a good answer. Um, he, of course, I could have answered he was obsessed with, with time and space, but this sounds a little bit heroic to me. So um, he he's really, you know, he's really um, sticking to what he is. He's feeling that he has to do, and then he doesn't. Um, there is a certain degree of truth. In um, but um, this is a complete truth. Is it really? Is it only this psychological aspect, um, or is it perhaps even a little bit um, of what he is um, explaining himself when he, ex he describes himself as a gardener? So this person has really no chance to step out um, because this, these images are painted, and he's giving his arm uh, to the images without painting themselves. Saturated, of course, but um, yeah. Well, I think we should probably take him to dinner now. He's still on terms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still fresh, and we have more, more questions to be. Well, I, I have one response to this. I agree that Sarah's was an excellent question. 
And, and, and this has to do, I have a demotion of Brock and then a praise of Brock. Brock would have limited gifts. He was a poor draftsman. He, was, he, couldn't, he couldn't paint the figure worth a damn. And so he focused on what he was best at. Mm -hmm. Picasso, by contrast, and this brings out Kate's point, um, in the 50s is uh, thinking retrospectively. He's looking back at the history of art. He's comparing himself to Delacroix and Anglin, Poussin, and so on and so forth. And Velasquez, above all. And Brock is not doing that. Brock is still pushing forward. Now, because Brock was not a figure painter, he never courted the danger of seeming to make caricatures. And Picasso always flirted with caricature in his work. I think it's possible to think of Picasso's work in this period is very thin in that respect, very brittle and very superficial. I've just been reading Leo Steinberg on Picasso, and so I'm, I don't actually believe that his work is superficial in the 50s. But Brock is focusing on what he does best, which I think is brought out by Sabina's question, which is a phenomenological approach to his environment. That keeping everything in view and within the compass of his touch, within his, his personal ambit, is a way of reinforcing his gifts, reinforcing what he did best. And what he does best, it seems to me, is to create these extremely sophisticated and complex paintings. I very much appreciated the the focus you, you gave in your lecture on these studio paintings, uh, because they are incredibly absorbing. As several people have said, they repay repeated viewings. Picasso, you get it, it's done mm -hmm. in the 50s. That's not true throughout all his career. Mm -hmm. The final thing I want to say is that Picasso is the elephant in the room for anything that Brock does. And the exhibition that I want to see is a Brock and Picasso exhibition on the scale, well, perhaps it could never be on the scale of the Matisse Picasso exhibition of about mm -hmm. 10 years ago, they 12 years ago. York. Pardon me? They had one in New York. Uh, Only the Cubism, Cubism. Oh, the Cubism at the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. I'm speaking of the entire careers of both artists mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah, that was a magnificent but very, very focused exhibition on a, six years or seven years. Mm -hmm. But a career-long comparison of Brock and Picasso, I think, would be very revealing. And it would reveal some of the shallowness of Picasso from time to time, and his flirtation with caricature, and it would reveal the depth of Brock's achievement in a very narrowly focused vein. Hmm. Yeah, and, um, perhaps, yeah, I would like to judge. Um, I would take the, all these notions of quality um, out of the comparison. Um, this is two different approaches of towards art, and, and Picasso is almost a, a virtuoso, um, so he can everything, um, and he is doing everything. And actually, he's right; he can do everything. Um, but this is perhaps a problem. Uh, you know, it's like Paganini uh, playing uh, the violin. Um, he was too good to be good, um, and this is perhaps a problem. And um, and um, caricature is the same, but or, you're so right with everything you say. Caricature is, of course, it's, um, it's, it's, it's the negative side of classicism. And he knows all this, and he, he does it. And, and um, very telling is, um, for example, if one does a show like this, um, and, you know, as usual, you have a, an introductory room with a photograph showing the art. And you can choose whatever picture you uh, uh, photograph that you want. You will see staged photographs of Brack in his studio, sincere, honest, um, trying to express his, his, his achievement. In and his French, painting. as opposed to Picasso's right. Spanish. Yes, this is also true. And, and, and what will you see if you take more or less any photograph of Picasso? Uh, you will see him doing something with his hands. Even by eating, he's, of course, he's arranging uh, the fish bones to a little sculpture or to a drawing or whatsoever. So he's always doing something because he, he can, you can give him whatever you want and he's making something out of it. Um, Mark goes, stands up after dinner and goes into the studio painting. Um, so there is there's a difference in, in just in type. Um, and of course, and it would be a fabulous show. And, and the Picasso Matisse show, um, this was the same which was in Paris in the, in the Grand Palais. They were because closely that, related. Yes, because I've seen it in, uh, over there. It was so telling. And it was so telling, uh, it was so interesting um, to compare these uh, artists. And there, there might be an even 
Uh, yeah, a, a, a similar a telling effect um, when, when, when one would do such a sort of show as you, you proposed to do. We'll talk. Yeah, it would be hard to get uh, the pieces on the horizon. <laughs> we asked Kate to do it. Uh, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was one 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 so sure. <laughs> uh, I think maybe it. we should throw Matisse into the mix, though. After seeing all these rocks yeah. with the color, I don't There's often a yeah, Matisse. Yeah, Matisse is a smaller elephant in the room. Kind of thing going on. But what is, and what is, would be very interesting because um, that is not so much rivalry between them. Um, they are friends, and then they are departing, um, and, but they never became rivals or enemies. And imagine, for example, a Picasso background show, or uh, imagine it even worse, a Picasso Kirchner show. Kirchner actually committed suicide because he was not as good as Picasso at the end. Imagine such an exhibition, and he was trying so hard all the late Kirchner that nobody loves but me, uh, showing, showing this guy really um, desperately being as successful, as good, as modern, as, as the only painter who was better as he himself. And he knew that he was better, even if his, his alter ego uh, writing about him, which he was himself, always telling that Kirchner, of course, is the most interesting artist of his time. Well, if Kirchner made a mistake, it was to take Picasso on on his own terms. Yeah, and which Brock, is completely stupid. Brock's pro yes, Brock's project might be in part, uh, I, I do see him as perhaps uh, seeking to distinguish himself from Picasso, seeking mm -hmm. to keep a distance from mm -hmm. Picasso for the, for the remainder of his career, mm -hmm. not taking Picasso on on Picasso's ground, mm -hmm. and staking on quite different grounds. But I think that Brock has, is, has Picasso in view throughout his career.